we're back at it, y'all, with Ban This Book. And Miss Amy Ann's trying to find a new way to make sure that everybody gets the books checked out of her locker. Tools of the trade. I stopped at the library's front desk before heading for my spot in the corner after school. I watched as a second grader checked out a small stack of books. Mrs. Jones scanned the little barcodes on the back with her laser thing, and the computer recorded what the book it was that the kid was checking out, and when it was due back. That was no help. I didn't have a computer or a scanner or whatever program she had that kept track of all of it all. Mrs. Jones noticed me watching. Thinking of becoming a librarian, Amy Ann? She asked. I jumped. People were always reading my mind. What? Oh, no, I was just interested in how it all worked. You know, the way you keep track of what books get checked out. Miss Jones ran the boy's book across the bonky thing that made them safe to take through the detectors at the front without setting off the alarm. It's all automated now, Mrs. Jones said. Certainly a lot less trouble than it used to be. What did it used to be like, I asked her. Let's see, Mrs. Jones said. She looked over at the paperback spinning racks. Bring me that copy of The Witch of Blackbird Pond. It was an old, beat-up copy of the book with a clear cellophane tape holding the cover on. Mrs. Jones flipped to the back of the book. Ah, uh, I thought this one might still have it in there. We've gone all digital now, of course, but I've never got around to taking these out of the older books. She turned the book around for me to see. There in the back cover was a little manila envelope with a card sticking out of it. Mrs. Jones pulled out the card. It's a date due card, she explained. Used to be we would have to take the card out of every book, stamp it with the due date, and then the person check checking the book out would sign the card. Of course, I had seen these in the back of some of the books I checked out, but never paid much attention to them. The card had the book's name and the author at the top. Underneath that were two columns, one for the date and the other for the borrower's name. The dates in the book were all from the 1980s. The names on the due date card had to be adults by now. They took the books and we kept the cards, Mrs. Jones said. We put the cards in order by the date, and then every day we would check to see what books had come due. How did the person checking the books out know when they were due, I asked her. Oh, we put a little slip of paper in each little pocket in the back with the due date stamped on it. The whole thing was an absolute headache for a large library. I was excited. My library was tiny. This was exactly what I needed. Do you have a different stamp for every day? Oh, heavens no. There was a neat little gizmo that could stamp any date. I wonder if I still have one. Mrs. Jones disappeared into the back office. I could see her rummaging around in a drawer through the windows. Envelopes, I could use a bunch of envelopes and tape them onto the back of the BBLL books. Then I could stick index cards down inside little pockets and place for people to sign their names. When the books were due, I could even slip a reminder note in the borrower's locker mailbox. Aha! I found one, Mrs. Jones said. Just goes to show you we never throw anything away around here. She came back with a little complicated hand stamp that was stained from red from years of use. It had a black knob on the top where you held it, and on the bottom were four rotating rubber pieces. One for the month, two for the numbers and the date, and one for the year. It was set for May 27, 1988. Mrs. Jones laughed. I suppose that was the last day we ever used it. I clicked the month forward and back. What an awesome gadget. I tried stamping it on my arm, but it was dry, of course. It only left a faint imprint of a date on my skin. Where can I get one of those? I asked. Miss Jones looked surprised. Oh, well, I suppose they still sell them somewhere. Office company stores, maybe. Though, I don't know how much call there is for them today. You can have that one if you want it. The little hairs on my arms tingled. Really? Well, I certainly don't need it anymore, Mrs. Jones said. And it is a little out of date. It only has the years 1980 and 1990 on it. I didn't care. The due date stamp was too amazing, and I would make it work somehow. Thanks, I said, and I ran off to my corner. All I needed now was a pair of glasses on a chain, and I was ready to be an official librarian. Nowhere to stomp to. The index cards and envelopes I found in my mom's home office, which doubled as the treadmill room and tripled as the guest bedroom and quadrupled as the place where we dump all the holiday stuff and anything else we didn't have a place for. Angelina's room had 
a glue stick, and there were a pair of scissors in the kitchen drawer. Now all I needed was a place to work. My bed wasn't a great place to cut and paste. Alexis was in there using my bedpost for a ballet bar again and playing her music too loud. The kitchen table would have been perfect, but Angelina had turned it into a pony barn. She used the paper shredder in mom's office to make hay again, and it was scattered all over the floor. I went to the living room instead where mom and dad were watching something with knights and, and swords on TV. Dad paused the show they were watching as I came in. What's up, kiddo? Just school stuff, I said. I set my things on the coffee table and settled in. Oh, I'm sorry, hon. We need you to find someplace else to work tonight, mom said. We're watching something you're not old enough to watch yet. And where do you expect me to go? I wanted to ask them. Alexis has turned my room into a ballet studio, and Angelina has turned the kitchen into a stable. I sighed heavily instead. I snatched up my things as angrily as I could and stomped into the kitchen. I need the kitchen table, I told Angelina. Nay, she said. I plunked my things down on the table. You're just playing, and I have a school project to do, I told her. Nay, Angelina said. I pulled out a chair and sat down, messing up her piles of shredded paper. No, no, I was here first, I was here first, Angelina screamed. She grabbed the chair I was sitting in and yanked on it. When she couldn't move it, I tried pulling and tried pulling me by the arm out of the chair. Let go, I'm working. You're ruining it, you're ruining it. Angelina, Amy Ann, my father called from the living room. Enough. Angelina stopped trying to pull me out of the chair and collapsed onto the floor where she rolled around kicking her legs and screaming at the top of her lungs. Girls, dad bellowed from the living room. I do not want to deal with this right now. I was here first, Angelina wailed. I was here first. Amy Ann, mom called. Your sister was already using the kitchen. Find someplace else to work. I pushed my chair back from the table as much noise as I could picked up my things, and stomped out of the kitchen, kicking Angelina's pile of shredded paper into the air as it, I went. She wailed even louder, which made me feel good, even though I was steaming mad. I still needed somewhere to work. I wasn't going to fight another battle with Alexis in my room, not after Angelina had already gotten my parents angry, and I needed more room than my old hideout, the bathroom. Angelina's fit and my parents yelling at us had woken the dogs and the scent of them scurrying into the hall, nubby tails down and unhappy they didn't like it when we yelled and they were looking for a place to hide like i was flotsam and jetsam followed me to mom's office the bed was covered with boxes of christmas decorations and blankets and camping gear we had never used and mom's desk was piled so high with papers and folders and boxes that was useless there was room on the floor though i plopped down with as much frustration as i could spread out my envelopes and note cards which flotsam and jetsam proceeded to step all over no no i told them but they kept moving around, wagging their tails ha in happiness as they bet my cards and envelopes. They weren't trying to be bad. They were just trying to get as close as possible to me. And since I was on the floor, they thought I was down there to pet them and play with them. I dodged the dog's big legs and collected all my things again and pushed past them into the hall. There wasn't a single place in the house that I could work. I stomped through the kitchen again where Angelina eyed me warily from underneath the table. I didn't even bother kicking her shred of paper. I went straight to the back door and outside, where it was raining. I dashed to Mom's car, jumped in the front passenger seat. There was no flat space to glue, and the car smelled like sour milk, but at least I could work there in peace. If only I could drive. Then I would have start, started the car and driven far, far away from there. I ran the back of my arms across I ran the back of my arm across my eyes, and I couldn't tell if I was wiping away rain or tears. The right to bear arms. Trey had already pulled our desk together when I got to class the next day. It was time to work on our Bill of Rights project together. Not that I expect him to do any of the actual work. All he did in class was draw pictures. I heaved my swelling backpack onto my desk with a thunk. Whoa, Trey said. What have you got in there? Like every school book you own? Yes, I said. I unzipped my bag and pulled out my social studies textbook out from the rest. I hit my desk with another thunk. It's very heavy. Why don't you keep all your books in your locker? Trey asked. I froze. Stupid. Amy Ann, stupid. The reason I had all my textbooks stuffed in my backpack was because all the space in my locker was taken up by the banned books. But of course I couldn't tell Trey that. I hate having to go out to my locker. I lied. But I see you out at your locker all the time, Trey said. You're always meeting people there. He was on to me. There's no question. He was trying to catch me in a lie, but I wasn't going to fall for it. Can we just get to our project? I said. We missed a whole day because I had to go to the office. 
I dug in my stuffed backpack for the notes I had made on the first amendment. Trey pulled out a sketchbook he carried everywhere. Yeah, what happened? Did you get in trouble with Principal Banana? No, I told him. I looked him in the eyes. Had he expected me to get in trouble? Was he just messing with me? If he was, he was hiding it pretty well. That's good, he said, but I didn't believe him. Here are my notes on the First Amendment, I said. Cool, he said. I drew some pictures. Of what? I asked. More pictures of me as a mouse? Trey looked confused. Um, the Bill of Rights for our project? I was stunned. Trey had actually done work on our project. He turned his sketchbook around so I could see. It was a drawing of a man with a huge furry arms with claws at the end. I frowned. What is this? I asked. The right to bear arms, he said. I rolled my eyes. It's bear, like carry, not bear, like woo, bear, I said. And besides, that's the Second Amendment. We're doing the First Amendment. I know, he said with a smile. I couldn't help. I couldn't help it. It was too funny. It was the first time I'd ever seen Trey smile, and it surprised me. He had a really friendly face under his uncombed blonde hair. When he smiled for a second, I liked, I kind of liked him and his funny drawing, which really was pretty good. But then I remembered who he was and what he had done to me in third grade. What does M-M-I-I-I mean? I asked. It was written in the bottom corner of the picture. Is that in Roman numerals or something? That's my signature, Trey said. Marvin McBride the third. Marvin McBride? I thought your name was Trey Spencer, I said. Trey is just my nickname, and my mom and dad divorced when I was in kindergarten, and they both remarried, he said. McBride is my dad's last name. He's a commercial illustrator. He lives in Atlanta with his new family. My mom married a guy whose last name is Wheeler, but she'd already gone back to using Spencer. That's her maiden name. Oh, I said. I didn't know what else to say about it. Did you do anything on the First Amendment? Yeah, Trey said. He flipped to another page where he'd drawn a picture of people bowing down before a weird-looking alien coming out of a UFO. Um, what is this? I asked. They're worshipping an alien, see? The First Amendment says Congress can't make laws about establishing religions, so they're free to worship aliens if they want. I don't think that's exactly what it's saying. That part is about how the government can't establish one religion and make everybody follow it. Oh, Trey said. He turned his picture around and looked at it. Too bad. I really like that alien. It works for the other part about religion, I told him. The free exercise clause. That's the one that says the government can't stop you from believing in whatever religion you want. What did you draw for that one? Trey flipped to the next page. In that picture, a bunch of people in pope hats and robes were lifting weights. Um, I said, I had no idea what I was looking at. The free exercise of religion, Trey said. He smiled slightly again. I knew that the free exercise of religion really, he knew what the free exercise of religion really meant, that you could worship whoever you want to, however you want to, not people in church doing weightlifting. But it was funny. I smiled despite myself. I think we better use the UFO picture instead of that one, I told him. Yeah, he said. Oh, I've got another one for freedom of press. The picture showed a woman pressing the middle of three big buttons. See, she's got the freedom to press whichever button she wants. I snorted, then caught myself. I did not want to like Trey or his pictures. You do know that freedom of the press means you can print anything you want and the government can't tell you not to, right? Trey shrugged. Shrugged. Mine's funnier. Did you do anything for the freedom to assemble? Trey turned the page to a large picture of a boy sitting on the floor building with Legos. I closed my eyes and shook my head. I thought about having him assemble a model car, but more people would get the Lego thing, I said. He said, the right to assembly says that we can't get together in public, that we can get together in public and protest stuff if we want, Trey said. I know, I know. I drew a real one for the right to petition. I couldn't think of anything funny for that. His picture of the right to petition showed a clipboard with lots of signatures on it. So there were at least two usable pictures. I ran down my list of the rights protected in the First Amendment. Sorry, guys. I ran down my list of rights protected in the First Amendment. There was only one we hadn't done, the right to free speech. 
Trey said he had a picture for that one too, and he flipped through his sketchbook looking for it. I expected Trey to have drawn a picture of somebody giving a speech without charging for it, or maybe a speech bubble, or the word speech breaking out of jail and going free. Instead, what he showed me was a drawing of a locker with a sign on it that said, Books banned at Shelburne Elementary. My locker. I looked up at Trey in surprise. He wasn't smiling this time, or even looking at me. He was staring at his hands. He was right, though. Making me take down my sign was against the freedom of speech. I hadn't even thought of it that way. But had he drawn it because he agreed with me or disagreed with me? I frowned at the thought. Are you ever going to tell me why you don't like me? Trey asked. You shouldn't have to ask, I wanted to yell. You should know that your mom is an awful person for banning books and you're an awful person for spying on me and drawing that stupid picture of me last year. Instead, I just grabbed the edge of my chair and stared angrily at my desk. Mr. Vaughn announced that it was time to put our books away for social studies and get out our vocabulary books. Okay, well, I'll work on the others and show them to you when I'm done, Trey said, and he dragged his desk back across the other side of the room. And in this corner, I kept trying to focus on liar and spy in my spot in the corner of the library, but all I could think about was Trey. He'd seen my list of banned books on my locker and studied it enough to draw it and get all the books right on the list. That meant he had to know it had been taken down too. I thought he would have wanted that, but the way he acted when he showed me that picture, it was like he was embarrassed or sorry. Hey, Trey said, I jumped, spitting out my braid I was sucking on. I was just thinking about him and there he was standing next to me. Sorry, he said, I didn't mean to scare you. I just, I drew a new picture of the right to assemble and I wanted to show it to you before I went home. Trey showed me. He'd drawn it right this time. The picture was a bunch of people standing on a sidewalk with signs in their hands that all said, vote no. All but one. It said, magnets, how do they work? Magnets, how do they work? I asked him. How do they work? It's like magic, he said. His smile told me he was joking. Anyway, that guy has as much right to be there as the rest of them, right? Yeah, I said, only that's not the freedom of assembly. That's freedom of speech. Yeah, Trey said. He looked at the floor again. The rest of it works though, right? And uh, uh, the rest of it works though, I said. And you draw really great. All the faces are different and you even drew the hands. Anytime I had to draw a person, I drew her with hands behind her back or stuck in her pockets because I couldn't draw hands and fingers. Trey shrugged. If you want to draw comic books, you have to be able to draw hands. I was about to ask Trey if that's what he wanted to do, draw comic books, when we both heard his mother's voice in the library. Good afternoon, Mrs. Jones, Miss Spencer said. Miss Spencer, Mrs. Jones said. Mrs. Jones was wearing a wide green dress with white polka dots. Miss Spencer was wearing a tiny powdered blue track suit. They looked like the illustrations for Big and Little in a picture book, and they stood staring at each other like those two Dr. Seuss characters who won't get out of each other's way while people build interstates around them. Is Trey in the library? Miss Spencer asked finally. I think he's in the back, Mrs. Jones said. She nodded down the aisle to us and my heart beat faster. It was dumb. Miss Spencer didn't know who I was or what I was doing with her list of banned books, but I still was so nervous I stuck one of the braids in my mouth and sucked on it. Trey, it's time to go, Miss Spencer called. I guess my ride's here, Trey said. See ya. Miss Spencer put her hand on Trey's head and was leading him out of the library when Mrs. Jones stopped them. Oh, Mrs. Spencer, I've been mean to thank you, she said. Miss Spencer turned. Thank me for the money you and the PTA raised to bring an author to the school. I just booked someone to visit. Dave Pink Plinky, Miss Spencer frowned, trying to place the name. Didn't he write? The Captain Underpants books, yes, Miss Jones said, that you banned. She could have said, but she didn't have to because we all knew it. Miss Spencer darkened. Do you really think that's such a good idea right now, she asked. I think it's a great idea right now, Mrs. Jones said. Miss Spencer looked so small and so mad that I half expected her to say, Oh yeah? Well, you just wait till Helen comes. Then you'll be sorry. Instead, she turned and led Trey out of the library, her chest heaving in her track suit, almost as much as if she'd actually done exercise in it. Round three in the boxing match had gone to Mrs. Jones.
maybe this fight wasn't over yet. All right, so stay tuned. We'll find out more coming soon.